When Josh Woodhams left home on the night of June 17th, he only had his phone and his wallet. According to the Lexington man's family, cell phone data indicates that his phone last pinged in two locations on the early morning hours of Sunday. At 2.30 a.m., his phone pinged within a three-mile radius of I-75 at, at, at exit 104 in Lexington. At 3 a.m., his phone was within a three-mile radius of the Clays Furry Bridge. The family told Fox 56 that he left his home on June the 17th on a 22-inch orange mongoose mountain bike, wearing a black Ohio State t-shirt, black Nike basketball shorts with gray and black New Balance shoes, tennis shoes. Woodhams was reported missing the next day. They are asking all homes and businesses in the area to check their camera footage during this time frame. It's possible he could have been he heading toward Morristown or Knoxville, Tennessee, where the family previously lived. The family and detectives are still trying to locate the orange mongoose mountain bike that he was riding. Box 56 spoke to the family's neighbor who's been relaying information on their behalf. We really need the public's help to locate that orange bike. I think it will be the key to finding him, she said. Even if someone found it abandoned and picked it up for themselves, we just want to know, and I guess they want to know where the bike was found. Woodhams is described as 6 feet 2 inches tall, weighing approximately 240 pounds. He's mostly bald, but does have light blonde hair and blue eyes. Anyone with information can call the Lexington Police Department at 859-258-3600. It's been almost two weeks since he was reported missing, but he has not returned home. His family members, friends, and the people of the Lexington community have been worried for his welfare. They would be able to trace his text messages or phone calls to see if maybe he had called someone. Is it possible that he made it to a bus station? They would have traced his um, credit cards, debit cards, his bank card. Josh Woodham's wife posted a post on social media that he was wearing a blue t-shirt when she saw him that night. But he might have changed the shirt before leaving home, as the blue t-shirt was later found at his house. The current status of Josh Woodhams is still missing and whereabouts are unknown. A friend of his wife posted, Please help bring, uh, bring this man home. He is a father and husband. He was last seen in the Polo Club Boulevard on Todd's Road of Lexington, Kentucky. Maybe he just sold the bike to someone on the street. Maybe he left the bike parked someplace and took off on foot. Maybe he got a ride. Maybe he got... I, I, like I said earlier, I don't know if they checked his... I'm sure that they've checked his bank records to see if he'd used his debit card or if he'd taken any money from an ATM or anything like that. Or even if someone else had attempted to use the card. They would have checked to see where where it was used at and, you know, check those cameras. Um, to the Josh Woodhams story, it just says, The family provides new information into the disappearance of a Lexington father. This was dated yesterday, July the 12th. It's been nearly a month since a Lexington father went missing. Josh Woodhams left his home on the night of June the 17th with only his phone and wallet and hasn't been heard from since. As the days go by, his wife Crystal fears the case is losing the momentum needed to bring her husband home. She says this would be out of character for her, for her husband. He's never done anything like this before. Uh, it goes on to talk about how he was on the Orange Mongoose mountain bike and surveillance footage confirmed and his cell phone data pinging the, to give a 
kind of a idea of where he was at. At around 2.20, he was spotted at the Speedway on Richmond Road. At 3 a.m., his phone was pinged within a three-mile radius of Clay's Ferry Bridge. Surveillance video shows Woodham wearing a red t-shirt the night of his disappearance. In the previous article, it was stated that he was wearing a black Ohio State t-shirt, but he was spotted on camera wearing a red t-shirt. The bike has still not been located. Police have conducted extensive searches for the missing father around his last known whereabouts. Crystal said this consisted of helicopters, drones, geothermal tracking, and canines, but the searches have come up empty. They even conducted foot searches with the help of friends and family and church members and handed out flyers. Fox 56 reached out to the Lexington police but have not heard back from them. They've also been searching the area around the river near Clay's Ferry Bridge, which was where his cell phone lights pinged. And that's, um, there's been no activity on his bank account or his phone. A GoFundMe has been organized to help the family with living expenses while they continue to search for their husband and father. The family believes Josh may have been heading down I-75, possibly towards the Knoxville area. So have they been doing any searches in Knoxville? Have they reached out to people that he knew in that area? It said the family had previously lived in that part of Tennessee. Um, I would say that the police should probably, or probably have been in contact with the police in that area. And maybe they have put out posters and flyers on some of the um, missing persons websites centered around Knoxville and that part of Tennessee. Because it's possible that he may have ditched the bike and caught a ride. So if he kept the phone with him and just took the battery out or just turned it off, it's possible at some point that he may turn it back on. Um, some some plans have joint, you know, you're on the same plan, you can trace any phone that's on that plan. So hopefully they, if he turns his phone back on, it's possible that something may have happened to him. He could have gone into the water. I don't know his state of mind that hasn't been mentioned here. Um, I haven't seen anything indicating why he left that night and what would be making him want to drive or ride a bicycle all the way to Knoxville from Lexington. That's quite a drive and quite heavy traffic. And so as of right now, that's all the update that there is. They've just been out searching for him. Um, maybe, maybe his wife has talked to the police about his state of mind that night and what was going on, what led to him you know, did he have some type of depression? Was he going through something? Had he lost his job? Were the two of them into an argument of some kind? Just something that might indicate his state of mind. Were, and, you know, was he involved in any kind of drug use or anything that might indicate where he might have gone? So, I don't know, but... If I hear any more updates on his case, I will come back with a follow-up. On the Amber Spradlin case, last night, now, the cousin that I mentioned in the previous video that did the press conference and gave the information about the brutal uh, stabbing of her cousin Amber, she did a podcast for the Nancy Grace podcast. And you can find Nancy Grace podcast. I, I'm, I think it's called Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. I'm not 100% sure about the name, but you can just type it in, Nancy Grace podcast. If you've got 
Spotify, iHeart, just about any of the uh, Apple, any of the podcasts, um, you can find it. And she said that it would be released sometime, I believe, today. Now, this is what was posted yesterday on the Justice for Amber Facebook page. New information from the state police. The state medical examiner confirms she died by multiple stab wounds. Detectives have interviewed several community members. They've executed numerous search warrants for the homes, electronic devices of the people um, who were at the home that night where this took place. Detectives are waiting on DNA testing results from the state crime lab. I want to say something about this real quick. I know that there are backlogs. I know that there are cases where that have been sitting waiting for DNA, waiting for new information for a long time. But as they have to sit and wait, the people, the perpetrator of this murder is walking around free. There were five other people at the home that night. We know three of them were um, her friend Roy Kidd, this dentist and business owner, Dr. Mike McKinney, and his son. I don't know who the other two people were. I don't know if that's been mentioned on the Justice for Amber page. Some people are disputing that a 911 call was ever made, and they're saying that there's no indication that the phone call came from Amber's phone. There was multiple um, stab wounds. Like it said, she was she was brutally, brutally stabbed to death, and not just stabbed, but sliced. And basically, this person was just taking this knife and brutalizing this young woman. This this thirty eight year old, uh, four foot eleven inch woman, and Someone in that home had to have heard the screams. They had to have at least heard some type of something going on. And not unless they were passed out dead, drunk to the world, you know. This is just my personal thoughts on it. I believe somebody probably did call 911. And there are those over here on one side saying there was never a 911 call made. So then what was the what was the reason why 911 finally did respond? Are they saying that this man woke up in the morning hours and goes downstairs and finds this horrible bloody scene and this dead woman laying in his home? At, I don't know if this took place in a bedroom, in a living area. I'm not sure if, it, if that's been mentioned. And then they called 911 and someone came running right away because they called and said, oh my goodness, I've just woken up and found a dead body in my house. And it's a, you know, they've been stabbed or something. The police took DNA, they took blood samples, the medical examiner, and they said that there was more than just her blood, there was other blood. So this is what they're waiting for. I'm guessing that they have taken DNA samples from the other people who were there that night. But someone murdered this girl, and they're walking around free right now. I'm not sure how all this stuff works, but when you're talking about the county, I think of the sheriff's department. But in most other areas, as far as I know, now in the metro areas like Louisville and Lexington, they may have their own 911 system for certain areas. I'm not sure how it works. But the Kentucky State Police has handled the calls for the most part in most other areas, as far as I know. But I just wanted to do that little follow-up. And a lot has been made about the 911 system. And some people say that they're making a big deal out of the 911 situation to sway the narrative away from the fact that a young woman, a, well, 38-year-old woman, went out that night after she got off work with some of the people she worked for, 
this Dr. Mike McKinney is is partial owner of the restaurant where Amber worked, the Brick House. They ended up at another um, place, a restaurant bar type place called the Seasons Inn or Seasons Inn that I understand is also owned by this man's brother. And I guess it kind of, after hours, it kind of turned into a private party and this group went back to this doctor's home in Arkansas Creek in the Martin area of Floyd County. And at some point during the night, this scuffle, struggle, whatever it was that took place, whatever, I don't know if this girl wanted to leave, if she was upset, if someone angered her in some way and she said something to someone or if she saw something she wasn't supposed to see. I don't know what happened. Nobody really does except for the people in that home and the person who murdered this woman. And like I said in my first video that I made about this, set 911 aside for a minute. 911 is an aftermath. 911 is what you reach out to once a crime or an accident or a illness has taken place. This took place regardless of whether 911 showed up or not. I understand the family's frustration and all the community's frustration that 911 should have responded. Maybe if they had and they had gotten there within a matter of three minutes, six minutes, or even 12 minutes, they may have been able to stop this crime. They may have been able to stop her death. But nobody will ever know that. But regardless, if she, even, let's say even if this person had stabbed her and she had survived, they're still walking around free right now. And that's the, that is where the anger comes in at from most of the people who. Now I want some, I, I'm, I read this last night. People, if you're from this area and, and maybe even not even just Eastern Kentucky, but any other area, we, a lot of places around where I'm from in Eastern Kentucky, we have hollers and we have roads that are called creek arkansas creek a lot of people who were not familiar with this fact that these hollers are often named after a creek some people were saying this took place in a creek i want to clear that up and let people know maybe you're not familiar with the hills and hollers of eastern kentucky but a lot of roads are named after creek. Arkansas Creek. I just read on Facebook that there were some nice homes in that area. And, you know, this man, this dentist lived there. He probably lived in a nice home. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up because someone was talking about that on this. They said that this that there were people saying, why was this girl in the creek? Well, they didn't understand that that was just the name of the holler, the road that this took place on. It actually took place inside of this dentist's home. So it wasn't like she ran out of the home and ended up in a creek. I know that's, to me and to people from where I'm from, it sounds kind of silly, but some people just don't understand, I guess. And as of right now, that's where everything stands. Um, I'm going to read this right here. This is from someone posted this. Someone posted this on the Justice for Amber page. It looks like it's something that was taken from a newspaper, maybe. Or maybe from a... a news website. The Floyd County Chronicle and Times, along with other news outlets, filed an open records request with Prestonsburg Mayor Les Stapleton asking for any and all logs of 911 calls made on Saturday, June the 17th 
as Sunday, June the 18th, as well as calls made by Spradlin on June the 18th. The, the request was denied by Interim Police Chief Russ Shirtliff due to the ongoing Kentucky State Police investigation. In addition, Shirtliff said such a record does not exist of any call made by Spradlin. The Prestonsburg 911 Center did not at any time on the 18th or in the days leading up to the 18th receive a call, 911 or otherwise, from Amber Spradlin. Um, so here's what other people are saying. These are some comments. From what I understand, the initial call was made because someone was drunk and they wanted them removed from the residence. They stated they were not harming anyone, but they just wanted them to be removed and taken away from their home. Then someone got on the phone and said they didn't need anyone to come. I don't know what the protocol is on responding to a call like that. See, this is where the argument comes in. Prestonsburg City Police 911 Center is saying that they never received a call from Amber Spradlin. And that's very possible because if she was under attack in such a brutal manner, this person was probably not going to stop stabbing her for a minute to give her time to call 911. It is very possible that no 911 call was made due to the fight or due, or due to this, um, be, you know, this event taking place. The 911 call may have been made due to an argument going on with a drunk person who made that call. Why would this homeowner and this man who's being accused of this murder not come out and speak and say, I never called 911, or I did call 911 earlier due to the fact that there was a drunk person in my home and I wanted that person removed. Um, they've probably been advised by their attorney not to speak on the case. I'll, that's why none of these people are speaking. And, you know, I'm not defending the murderer, but I'm saying that they are doing the right thing as far as not speaking. Because if they have a good counsel they will tell them do not speak to anybody why won't our officials just be truthful and say amber did not call 911 but a call was made from the residence they're not wanting to say that a call was made earlier whether it was one hour earlier 20 minutes earlier or two minutes earlier before this crime took place 911 did not respond I thought, and I, I guess I'm wrong about this, but I thought that if someone called 911, they got to the bottom of the reason why that 911 call was made. You can, you can pick up the phone and call the police department directly and say, listen, I'm having a problem at my home. There's some drunk person here. I'm wanting them to leave. Can I get anybody to come out and escort them away from my home? They're too drunk to drive, obviously. They need to be removed from my home. You may or may not get any help. But when you call 911, that is emergencies. Now, a drunk person or people in the midst of a party and, and they're arguing may pick up the phone and call 911. But I thought that when someone picked up their phone and called 911, they did not stop investigating that 911 call until they close that out. Maybe I'm wrong. Most police departments are supposed to follow up and go to the, the residence or at least stay on the phone, ca call that number back. If some people call 911 and hang up, they will call right back. So why did they not, call, did they call back to this home that night and say, a lot of people are saying that they're trying to um, use this as a way to take attention off of the actual crime. Um, this person says that they should have subpoenaed the phone records from every individual in that home that night to see if any of them called 911. Well, they would know, wouldn't they? 
I mean, wouldn't 911, wouldn't the, uh, the city police or whoever the dispatcher is that takes the 911 calls have that log of who made 911 calls that night? As I sit here talking about this, I'm just going to wrap this up and say I fully believe them when they say Amber did not call 911 that night. She was in the midst of fighting for her life. Had she got her phone and tried to make the call, it was probably knocked out of her hands. And that's all the update I have on that right now. But it's just a very sad, ongoing case. And I hope that they pretty soon make an arrest for the... And I hope they make the right arrest. I think the Kentucky State Police are hoping to get this DNA information back so that they can. They probably have the suspect in mind. As of right now, that's really all I have to go on. If any new information comes out, if an arrest is made soon, I will do a follow-up. And thanks for watching.